This evening, as I mentioned this morning, we are going to look at now that the Lord has raised us to life through the resurrection of Christ. What has He raised us to? What are we supposed to be like, actually? It's not so much we're going to see something that we need to look at so that we can kind of try to mimic, but rather it's a new nature that the Lord creates in us, something that He begins within and works its way to the outside, something that will be true of us if we actually have been raised to life. We will have this new nature. Now, what I'd like to do is begin by reading 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 21. But what I'd like to focus on is verse 17, which is a very familiar uh, passage, I think, to uh, most, if not all of us here. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 14, Paul writes, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ Be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Well, again, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now, again, this morning we we did see the importance of the resurrection that God raised Jesus to prove that he was who he said he was, that he is the Son of God, and to prove that everything that he said was true. And it was also his declaration that our sins, that Jesus bore on the cross, have been forgiven. And we saw this morning that if his sacrifice had not been accepted, he would have stayed in the tomb. There would have been no resurrection. And everyone who died trusting in him would have perished. If he hadn't been raised, we ourselves would have no hope. But we were reminded that Jesus was raised. His claims were proven to be true. His payment has been received as a payment in full. So if you have turned from your sins, if you have trusted in Jesus, your sins are forgiven and you do have eternal life. Now, Jesus has completed, as we saw this morning, the work of the new creation. We're going to see how that applies this evening, but we do need to remember what we've already seen, that when we meet together on the Lord's Day, on this day that he entered into his rest to celebrate that event and to worship him, we're not doing it for nothing. We're not doing it in vain. Something has really happened. There really is life. We really do have life in Christ. Now this evening, I'd like to follow up on that theme of the new creation. I think something we don't really focus a great deal on, at least certain aspects of it we do, but certain aspects we don't, by looking at how this work that Jesus finished should change the way we live. Again, not just call us to a higher standard, but actually move us from within. Now if you're trusting Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven, and you are on your way to heaven, And the new creation that he's going to bring in eventually, the new heavens and the new earth, belongs to you. That is what we call the kingdom of God in its its full sense. And it's uh, consummative is the word we usually use. The consummation, the fullness when the Lord brings in, the the complete end. Uh, That belongs to you if you're trusting in Jesus Christ. But one question we always have to ask ourselves is this. How can we know 
that it really does belong to us? How can we know that we really are trusting Jesus? How can we know that what we have, the faith that we have, or that we believe we have, is actually a saving faith, that it's more than just simply believing the facts? Again, many churches believe that's all you need to do. But the Bible tells us it's more than that. You need to be more than just convinced these things are true. There's also that saving aspect of this faith, which is a change of heart. Paul says you can know you have saving faith. He says you can know that the new creation belongs to you, that you will see heaven, you will be a part of the new heavens and the new earth if you have become a new creature. If you're part of the new creation that is in Jesus Christ, you will be a new creature in Jesus Christ. Now what I'd like us to do this evening is just simply look at two things. First of all, that everyone who trusts in Jesus Christ becomes a new creation or a new creature, a new kind of creature who lives a new kind of life. That's actually the second point. You become a new creature if you trust in Jesus and that means, secondly, that you will live a new kind of life. Now, first of all, Paul says that everyone who trusts in Jesus is already a new creation or a new creature. In verse 17 of our text, which is what we're looking at, the first part says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Now, let me just say that doesn't just mean in principle, but that means in reality. And there's different aspects to what this means. Now what I'd like to do is just back up for a bit to understand more of what it is that Jesus did when he completed his work and rose from the dead. We need to see that it's far more reaching than just the redemption of souls, although that's the part we're most interested in, I think. But it's more far reaching than that. Jesus in his work didn't just redeem the souls of his people. He actually redeemed the universe, the whole thing. Now, the universe needed to be redeemed. As a matter of fact, as we study the universe, we do see that it's running down. Something has gone wrong with it. And that's because the sin that Adam committed against God as the head of the human race, as our head, he also committed as co-ruler of creation. Remember when God made him, he said, rule over the really over the whole creation. And he breaks it down exactly what he means by that. He is God's... I think the correct term is vicegerent or co-ruler. He is the one who was given stewardship over the world, the one who basically had control over it and the command to multiply and to fill the earth and to subdue the earth. But when he sinned, his sin brought a curse. Not only on us, we were born dead in trespass and sin because of his sin, but on the whole creation. The whole creation has been affected by the sin of man, not just this planet, but every planet, every star, everything that's going on in the universe. Paul tells us actually in Romans chapter eight, the whole creation right now is suffering under this curse and sort of um, personifies the creation in that he says it's looking forward to the time when it's going to be free from this curse. Paul says in Romans eight verses 20 through 22, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. By the way, it tells us that it's suffering right now. It's suffering, as it were, these groans and uh, these pains of childbirth, waiting for the time that it's going to be set free, and that time is when the children of God are revealed. Now, the reason why creation is going to be set free is, again, the, the reason why we're going to be set free from corruption, because of what Jesus did in his work on the cross, in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection in doing that. He not only redeemed us, but he redeemed the creation. Uh, Paul writes to the church at Colossae in Colossians 1, verses 19 through 20. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, 
having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. By the way, when it says all things, we do need to understand there are certain aspects of creation that aren't going to be uh, reconciled to Jesus Christ. It really has to do with a certain portion of two different groups of moral creatures, mankind and the angels. Everything else is redeemed by Christ, but there will be those men who will not trust him and who will suffer forever for their sins. And there are those angels that have no hope of redemption that fell away from the Lord when they followed Satan in his rebellion in heaven. But we also read in scripture that what Jesus Christ has done in principle will one day become a reality. This present heavens and earth will be transformed one day into the new heavens and the new earth. It will be set free from its slavery to corruption. Now Peter says in 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 13, it almost sounds like what he's saying is everything's going to be obliterated, but we do need to understand that this destruction, this burning, as it were, the elements of the creation is simply its purification and out of which the, the new heavens and the new earth will come. He says this in 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 13. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. By the way, let me just say as, as a note, uh, it does seem as though, as I've said, Peter seems to be describing this as an utter destruction, the melting of these present heavens and earth, almost as if he eliminates them and then brings in something entirely new. But we've already seen from what Paul said, creation is groaning, desiring to be set free from its corruption, and it will be set free from its corruption when the Lord comes, when the children of God are revealed, which is when Jesus comes again, to raise the dead and to bring an end to all things, at least human history as it exists now, and to bring in the new heavens and the new earth where there is righteousness. There is continuity between the old creation and the new creation, just as there's continuity between these bodies that we're living in now and those bodies that will be raised, the same bodies, transformed into his glorious image and then reunited with our souls that we may be with the Lord forever. So that same continuity between our present body and our glorified body is going to be the same continuity between the old creation and the new creation because Jesus did more than just redeem souls when he did the work that he did. He redeemed the whole creation. But of course, the thing that's most important to us is his work was also to redeem his people, everyone who trusts in him, everyone who is baptized into him by the Spirit of God who is in Christ, immediately becomes a part of that new creation that is in him. That's why Paul writes in our passage in verse 17, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. When the Spirit of God puts us in Christ, unites us with Christ, that new creation that is in Christ is immediately applied to us and we become a new creation, part of that new world that he has created. And why Paul also writes in Galatians 6.15, for neither, circumcision, for neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Circumcision of the flesh, uncircumcision of the flesh means nothing. Circumcision of the heart means everything. That is the new creation. That's what it means to be a part of Christ. Now what Paul means is if you're trusting Jesus Christ, the effects of the fall are reversed. They're reversed in you. He has made you new. He has made you a new creature, just like he's going to reverse the effects of the fall on the creation. Now part of you is new right now and part of you is going to be made new later. Now the part that's going to be made new later is of course your body. Right now your body is still a part of the old creation. 
Okay, that means it's still under the curse. It's still waiting for its redemption. It's like the rest of the creation. It's exactly what Paul says when he continues in Romans 8 verse 23. He says, and not only this, that is not only is the creation groaning and suffering, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. You see, our body may be redeemed in principle, but it's not redeemed yet in practice, we might say, or practically. Like creation, our bodies are going to be redeemed when Jesus comes again to raise the dead, and he is coming to raise the dead. At that point, our bodies will be raised again to life and changed. We read in John 5, verses 28 through 29, after Jesus tells us, or actually tells his audience there, that an hour is coming and now is when those who hear the voice of the Son of God will live. A spiritual resurrection, he says, don't marvel at this, uh, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. You see, not everyone's redeemed, right? Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 through 17, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That doesn't mean before the wicked, but it means before the living in Christ. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 53 through 54. For this perishable must put on the imperishable. And this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. It isn't until then that our bodies are actually redeemed. And because your body is yet to be redeemed, it will grow old. It will get sick. It will eventually die. But the Lord will redeem it when he comes again. As I've said, it's already redeemed in principle. If we've trusted Jesus, he's redeemed us soul and body. But the reality or the fullness of that is not going to come until Jesus comes again. But, as I've said, part of you is not yet redeemed. Part of you is redeemed. The part of you that is redeemed is your soul or your inner man. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4.16, Therefore we do not lose heart, for though our outer man is decaying, and that's talking about our body, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. This renewing of the inner man, this is what's called the new man, the new self, the new you. It's a new nature, a new disposition that the Lord has given to you, it is the Spirit's work in your soul that changes the whole direction of your life. Now this brings us to the second point. If you are part of the new creation in Christ, then his life will reveal itself in you. You will be a changed person. You will be a new creature in your soul. Now you can know that you're a new creature, you can know that you're a part of the new creation because you have this new disposition. Paul writes in the second part of verse 17, 2 Corinthians 5, the old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. What Paul is saying is if you are in Jesus Christ, you are no longer the person that you once were. Now, you are still yourself. I mean, you're still aware of the continuity between your old self and your new self. You know that that was you back there. But you're different now. You're a morally better version of what you were before. You've been set free from sin. Sin can no longer control you. Now, we know that it can influence you, but you no longer have to obey it. And that makes a huge difference in the way that you live. 
Paul says in Romans 6, verses 3 through 7, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ, and again, this is spiritual baptism, have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into his death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. And Paul's point is this, we have died. We died with Christ when he died on the cross. When we trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and we were baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit, which actually made us alive and gave us the ability to trust in Jesus Christ, we died. And now we are free from sin. And as we saw this morning, we were raised again to life through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which means we have been raised to a new kind of life. Now, I know the kind of, you know, the way that Paul describes this in Romans chapter 6 almost sounds like we are absolutely free from sin and we don't have to, uh, well, we don't have to sin anymore. We, we, we won't sin anymore. That would be nice. That would be very nice if that were the case. And that is the heart of every Christian that we would desire that all of our sin, all our imperfection, everything we do that dishonors God would be gone and we would do only that which is pleasing to Him. But sadly, that isn't the case. Even though we've been set free from sin, even though you are freed from sin, even though you don't have to obey it, even though you don't have to listen to temptation when you are tempted, you will still sin because there is still corruption in your soul. If that weren't the case, Paul wouldn't write in Galatians 5.17, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. That old man was crucified with Christ. That old man was dealt, you might say, a mortal wound on the cross, but that old man is not yet dead. He's still alive and he still influences us and that's why we still fall into sin. But one thing we need to realize is in Christ, even though the old man isn't dead, you still don't have to listen to him. You don't have to obey him. You can do what is right. And I would say even more, you will do what is right. Paul writes in Galatians 5 verse 16, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. You have flesh still in you. That's that corruption remaining from the old man. But the Spirit, you see, here's the difference. The Spirit is now at work in you. And that work of the Spirit is the new nature. It is the new creation. It is the new creature, the new disposition in your soul to do what the Lord would have you to do. It's what Paul means when he writes in 2 Corinthians 5.17 after saying the old things have passed away, that's the old man, behold, new things have come. That is the new nature. Paul writes in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That is, Christ lives in me by his Holy Spirit and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Now this work of the Spirit in your life is so powerful that it overcomes the old man, it overcomes the flesh and changes the whole direction of your life. Before you were in Christ, the Bible says you were the slaves of sin. You practice sin just like every other child of the devil because we were children of the devil coming into this world. John writes in 1 John 3.8, the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. That is what we were like before the Lord Jesus Christ, before we were made new creatures. That is what the old man is all about. But now that you're in Christ and his spirit is living within you, you practice righteousness 
Again, John writes in, in the same chapter, verse seven, little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Now, before you were a new creature, when you were still a child of the devil, when you were still of this world, you were no different than anyone else in this world. That's what Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. This is what we were like outside of Christ. But now that he has given you his spirit and raised you from spiritual death to life, you are different. You are as different as light is from darkness. Uh, Paul goes on to say in Ephesians chapter 2, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. You see, the Spirit of God works within us to make a difference. We no longer walk according to the prince of the power of the air. We no longer walk like the rest of the people of the world or live like the rest of the people of this world. Instead, we do good works, the works that God created us to do and recreated us to do. We read also in Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. Not just redeem us from the guilt of our sins, but the power of our sins to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. There's a difference in the lives of those who were part of this world but now are new creatures in Christ. We live a different kind of life. Now, in one sense, this new life is really something you don't have any control over. It's something that is simply true of you. It is a new nature, a new desire that's in your heart to serve the Lord. If you're in Christ, you are a new creature with a new nature, and that new nature will exert itself in your life. It must exert itself in your life. It will make changes in your life. The things you used to love about this world, now you're going to hate. The things you used to hate about God and His kingdom, now you're going to love. You're naturally going to incline toward the things of the Lord and His kingdom because those are the things you're going to want more than anything else. I think that's something we don't often think about. This isn't something you have to work yourself up to do. It's not something you have to fight against to do it. In one sense, it's something you want to do. And you know, when you want to do something, you do it, right? But in another sense, this new life is something that um, you have to cultivate, something you have to strengthen. You have a new nature, you have a new desire, an inclination towards God and His kingdom that wasn't there before. But you still have something that was there before, and that is the remaining life of the old man. It has been crucified, but it's still alive to some degree, which is why the Lord tells us that you need to work to put it off. You're not to allow any of it to remain. It all has to go. Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 24, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk, and it means live, of course, no longer just as the Gentiles also walk or live, in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, 
And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. You need to work to put off the old man, put off everything that has to do with him, and put on the new man, put on Jesus Christ. Paul writes to the Philippians in Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. When Paul says work out your salvation, he doesn't mean justify yourself in the sight of God, do enough good work so God will accept you. But what he means is that part of salvation that has to do with cleaning up your life. That's the part we need to work with God. Uh, we need to uh, yield to the Spirit of God as He gives us the desire to do what's right and fight against every inclination to do what we know God tells us is wrong. This is something the Bible says you will do if you are a new creature because the new nature in you will compel you. You will fight to do what's right because you must, because that is what you are. This is what the new creature is that you become in the Lord Jesus Christ. So in closing, let me just apply this by asking you this question as I compare the old man with the new and what it is the Bible says is true of the new creature. Does this describe your experience? Do you have this new nature? Do you have these new desires to seek after the Lord, to do the things he tells you to do as far as putting off the old man, putting on the new? Do you love God? Do you love his word? Do you love his kingdom? Are you seeking his kingdom? What are you doing with your life? Are you serving God with your life? Do you want to please him in your life and everything you do? Do you want to honor the Lord in all that you do? Is that your greatest desire? When you're faced with a choice, do you think about what God says in his word? Do you have regard to his word? You know, what you've read in the scriptures, what it is, the one you, you know, as a Christian, with a new nature that moves you to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, do you really try to love him? Do you really do what it is he, he tells you to do in his word? Do you think, this is what God says, so this is what I must do? And when you find in yourself that you want to do something other than that, do you fight against that desire to do something other and yield to what the Lord says? And not perfectly, but are you striving to do what he calls you to do? And are you grieved when you fail to honor your Lord in doing what he calls you to do? And are you striving by his grace to do it better, to do what the Lord calls you to do? Now, one thing, let me just again, remind us of that the evidence that you are a new creature and part of the new creation has to be more than a desire that's in you that, that barely moves you beyond indifference. That, that is just a very slight desire. Yeah, I have some inclination to do this. Uh, it's more than just having the desire to attend one church service on Sunday. That's the extent in, in many Christians' lives. That's as far as it goes. It's more than just having a passing desire to read the Bible sometimes or to pray sometimes or once in a while attend a midweek study. The evidence that you are a new creature in Christ is a new zeal for his glory, not just, again, a slight inclination towards doing something you really don't want to do, but it is a zeal. It's described as a love for God that is with your whole heart and mind and soul and strength and a desire to reach out to your neighbor with the gospel in order to bring them to Christ or to minister to their needs when they are in need. Jesus describes this zeal as, as a heat, as being hot for his glory. And again, I just draw your attention to that very familiar and very um, convicting verse 
in Revelation 3, verses 15 through 16, where Jesus says to the church at Laodicea, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot, so because you were lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, sometimes, you know, we don't really understand what lukewarm means. I think we you know, have some idea from some of our experiences in, in life, but literally means that you're somewhere between cold and hot. You're not cold and you're not hot. You're just somewhere in between. If you are somewhere in between, the Lord says in this passage, he, at least he said to the Laodiceans, and I don't know why he would single them out, but he says to us, if that's your heart, I will spit you out of my mouth. And again, I think literally that means vomit. And that's not a good thing. We want to be hot for the Lord. And I think the point is this, if you're a part of the new creation, you will have this kind of zeal for his glory. Now, does that describe you? Is that what you are? Is that what you desire? If it doesn't describe you, then you need to come to the Lord. You need to come to him this evening. You need to ask him to put that fire in your heart. That fire is the Holy Spirit. That is what he does in the lives of his people. Ask him to put that fire in your heart because without it you won't be able to turn from your sins. You won't be able to trust him and you won't be able to serve him in the way that he calls you to serve him which is with all your heart. And let me just address the rest of us here this evening who have actually trusted the Lord because again what the Lord says is true of the new creature is, uh, the creature is, is convicting to us as well, isn't it? Because perhaps we have experienced this fire in the past, but maybe the fire is burning low in our hearts now and we don't have that zeal perhaps we once had. Well, if that is the case with you, then you need to come to him as well, not for salvation, but to ask him to renew that commitment you once had, to return to your first love, to stoke uh, the fire that's in your heart with his Holy Spirit. Sadly, sometimes the, the fire can burn low. And as we've already seen, it is partially up to us, isn't it, to um, move forward with what the Lord calls us to do, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Part of that work is seeking the Lord for more of His Holy Spirit and seeking to be filled with the Spirit. That's actually a command that's given to us by the Apostle Paul. We are commanded not to be drunk with wine, but to be filled with the Spirit, which means it's possible to be filled with the Spirit. It's our responsibility to be filled with the Spirit. There's something we have to do to be filled with the Spirit. We need to use the ways God has given to us to be filled. This is one, the Lord's Supper. This is another, His Word, reading His Word, praying, fellowshipping with Christians who have zeal for the Lord. We need to encourage one another, but most of all, we need to seek the Lord, that He would send His Spirit. You know, I don't know if you noticed, but on that day we fasted and prayed. Those of you perhaps um, who, who did spend that time fasting and praying may have noticed some additional zeal in your life because that is one of the ways God gives us more of his Holy Spirit. It's something that is precious, something we need, and he is the only one who can actually make us what it is that the Lord calls us to be. So if you find the fire burning low, you need to seek the Lord in all the different ways he's given you to seek him until he builds up within your heart that fire, that holy desire that can answer to the grace that he has given to you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus suffered, he died, he took the wrath of God upon himself on the cross, was placed in the tomb. And how do we respond to that? I mean, he did that for our salvation, he did that for us. And how do we respond to that? Are we just barely moved by that? I mean, how should we be moved by it? We need to see it for what it really is and only the Spirit of God can give us that spiritual sight of this glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to seek Him until we see it. And we need to try to maintain that kind of zeal for the Lord. And not only us, but of course the whole church needs to do this. And if we don't do this, we're not really gonna see anything happen. We're not gonna see the kingdom of heaven move forward because God uses that kind of person who is zealous for His glory 
to advance his kingdom. Those are the kinds of people that Jesus can use. And that's the kind of people that he calls us to be. And certainly, he's done everything to deserve all of our love, all of our devotion, all of our attention. So let's pray that God would give to us a love in response that answers up to that grace that he has shown us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's, let's pray specifically for this and then we'll take a few moments and prepare to come to the table.